activate. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Herod was one of those uh, people that wanted to know. He had some questions, but his approach was um, pretty much the way the world approaches it. So that's what we're going to take a, a look at today in our study. Now, it's kind of based off on where we left off last week in John 18, 38, which was the end of the fourth trial, where Pilate uh, has had this discussion with Jesus, and, uh, and Pilate just kind of flippantly says, what is truth? And after that, he went back outside to the Jews, and he said, look, I find no guilt in him. Now, between verses 38 and 39 in John 18, there is another trial, and this is this trial by Herod. It's not mentioned in <coughs> any other gospel except the gospel of Luke, Luke which we'll talk about in just a moment. But I want you to see uh, what happened in that trial, and it's recorded in Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 4. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. This is where, where we just left off. Uh, verse 5, but they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, even to this place. And verse 6, uh, Pilate says, wait, 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 wait. He's, he's from Galilee? He's a Galilean? And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time, probably because of the Passover. Verse 8, when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. So <clears throat> the chief priests and scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. Now, the Gospel of Luke is the only Gospel that mentions this trial, probably because it was very, very quick and really pretty worthless. Uh, in fact, Jesus never even spoke a word at this trial, never even answered uh, a question in this trial. But of all the gospel writers, Luke was a little more sensitive to the political issues of the time, and so he saw something in this exchange that uh, merited attention. Now, I want to give you a little history uh, background to what was going on at the time. Tiberius, a guy by the name of Tiberius, was the Roman emperor. He lived in Rome. Um, Pontius Pilate was the Roman prefect over Judea. Uh, in other words, he was the Roman chief officer in charge of Rome's matters in Judea, <clears throat> Judea being part of the Roman territory at the time. Rome had conquered that area, and Pontius Pilate was in charge of Judea at the time. Now, Rome had an interesting way of exercising control over the territories, territories that had become part of their empire. They would use local or regional political players to run sections of the territory. So it wasn't just all Romans that were running the territories. They would put certain people from the areas who were subservient to them in, in charge, basically, in a position of authority over those particular territories. And by doing so, uh, that, they kept political di dissidents, local political dissidents, from rising up against Rome. And they were, they were very good at handling it that way. So Rome had a local ruler <clears throat> at one time who was over that entire area. And his name was Herod. He was called Herod the Great. And uh, he was, even though he wasn't Roman, he was subservient to Rome at the time. When he died, he left in his will that his three sons would take over, the, the, the territory would be split up into three sections, and they would take over the rule of, of that land. Well, the three sons didn't get along, uh, and so they go to Rome to plead their case. They want you know, to, to fulfill the wishes they want to be in charge of this territory. And Rome um, acquiesces and says, okay, <coughs> we'll fulfill your father's wishes in, in the will, and you'll each have a part of that territory. Now, here's where it gets a little confusing. Each son, as was the tradition of the time, bore uh, at least the father's name, and so there was, the three sons were called Herod Archelaus, 
And Herod Archelaus was over the section that included Jerusalem. He was the Herod that you read about in the Bible at the time that Jesus was born. So there was Herod Archelaus. He didn't last very long. He died just within a few years after Jesus was born. Then there was Herod Philip, who was uh, over this, uh, the northeastern section of Judea. And then there was Herod Antipas, who was over Galilee and an area that was over the north of the, uh, the Dead Sea and to uh, the, the, the east, actually, of the Dead Sea. So there was, um, there was those three different guys named Herod in the picture. So it can get a little confusing. But today what we're talking about is this Her- guy named Herod Antipas. And uh, he was known that Russia, uh, Russia, <laughs> Rome considered him to be a tetrarch. That's what they referred to him as, meaning ruler of a quarter. <coughs> and basically what it meant was that Roman, the Roman government had authorized him to be uh, a governor over part of the territory that Pontius Pilate was actually in charge of. So Herod was under Pontius Pilate. He was, he was supposed to answer to Pontius Pilate. Uh, Herod Antipas, by the way, was also the one that put John the Baptizer to death. Uh, but he had spent, because of his territory, Galilee and so forth and so on, and since Jesus had spent most of his life in that part of the country, uh, it was considered that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction. Now, there was bad blood between Pilate and Herod. Herod had been put in this position by Caesar Augustus. He was actually in position before Pontius Pilate came on the scene. And so Herod and, and the Herod lineage, the family line, Herod the Great, and now Herod's three sons <clears throat> were in, in charge. They had been there for, for several years running the land. Um, but Tiberius, Caesar Augustus was the guy that put them in charge. Now Tiberius is the emperor, and he puts Pontius Pilate in charge. And Herod didn't really care for Pilate because Herod had his own way of doing things, and he didn't like Pilate meddling in his affairs. Now, I will tell you that Herod, particularly Herod Antipas, actually all of them, but Herod Antipas was a head case. Uh, he caused all kinds of political mayhem, and it eventually caused Rome to intervene. This was several years later. Rome finally had to intervene and exile him, you know, kick him out. Um, but at this point, when Pilate chooses to send Jesus to Herod, it's Herod Antipas, Pilate was probably doing two things. He was probably shirking um, the pressure that was being put on him by the Sanhedrin to put Jesus to death. And he may have seen this as a way to throw uh, a bone to uh, Herod and acknowledge his political authority. You know, kind of a way of saying, look, I understand that you want to be in charge and you want to be the ruler over that territory. Okay, you be the ruler over territory. I'm sending this guy. He's from Galilee. I'm sending him to you. And Herod, I'm going to jump ahead now, but Herod takes this from, from G, this, this man, this Jesus, whom he's heard about because he is the governor, if you will, over that territory. So he knows about, he's heard about Jesus. And uh, he, he sees what's going on and he realizes this guy isn't guilty of anything. There's, I mean, really, there's nothing other than uh, uh, they say that he says that he's a king. So, so he decides to play a joke. He takes this very serious matter that's going on with the trial of Jesus, and he dresses Jesus up like a king in what Luke describes as a a robe of splendor. Now, the robe of splendor was, later on, the Roman soldiers put a a purple robe on him, and they were mocking him because of uh, that was was the Roman color for, for authority. But Herod, remember, was not Roman, so he puts a, a robe of splendor on him, which was the robe that those kings of, of his day wore, and it was a, a white robe with um, all kinds of, of um, uh, silver lining stuff in it. It was very, very bright, and so when the sun hit it, it was almost like it had little mirrors in it. When the sun would hit it, it would just be splendorous. It was just extremely bright. So he takes a robe out of the closet or something and puts it on him, and they're making fun of him, and sends him back to Pilate as a joke. Oh, yeah, here's a, here's a guy who says he's a king, you know, ha, 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 ha. And now Herod sees it as a joke, and, and as the Bible said, Herod and Pilate now become friends. So this whole mockery 
completely ignored what was really going on uh, with, with Jesus and what the Sanhedrin was really trying to do. Now, Herod is in town at the time, uh, probably because, not because he was celebrating the Passover, he wouldn't have been doing that, but it was the, the big festivity for the, uh, the Jews, and there was a lot of government uh, decisions that were made during Passover time, and it was the time for them to meet because so many of, of the Jews were in one place at one time. So he was, he's in town, most likely staying at the complex where Pilate lived, which was probably a very large complex, or if not there, at least very, very close by because he would have most likely been staying in a, some sort of quarters that were owned by the Roman government, and they just basically kept everything in, in, in the same area. I mentioned earlier that Luke is the only gospel that mentions this particular trial. Uh, but Luke saw something that, that jumped out in this trial uh, with Herod. And what he seems to have noticed was how the world sees Jesus. How the world really, really comes to, to how, what they think about Jesus. And if we can understand this, it will help us when we're dealing with people uh, in our lives, our co-workers, family, neighbors, people who don't really believe in Jesus, aren't followers of Christ, and they have their opinions about God, and they have their opinions about Jesus, and sometimes you just don't know what to say. Where are they coming from? Why do they think this way? So I want us to see these four things. These are the four ways that the world is, is looking at Jesus, and, and basically what they're doing is putting God on trial. They're putting, they've been putting God on trial in their own life. And the first thing that they notice is, the first thing that they want is they want a sign. That's what happened with Herod. Herod saw Jesus. He was very glad. He had long desired to see him because he had heard about him. So this trial started off on a good note. Herod's, hey, come on in. I've heard a lot about you. I really want to meet you. I've been, I've heard all of these good things about you and, and uh, I want to see a sign. I want, to see, I want to see you do a miracle. I want to see something. And Jesus never says a word. The world is looking for a sign. You are dealing with people who don't know God, who don't have a relationship with God, and they're looking for a sign. They're looking for a miracle. They're looking for something that will prove that God is God or that God exists. And in their own perspective, in their own concept of God, he doesn't measure up to what they think he should be, or the, what they think he should do, or what they think he should say. And so because he doesn't fit their definition of God, or their parameters for the way God should behave, then they discount him. He's not going to, he's not, he's, he doesn't measure up because obviously he doesn't exist, or, or he doesn't care, or he isn't, uh, he isn't a God that's involved in my life, so I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not going to be interested in that. The, the, the interesting thing about that is that those decisions that, that the world makes about God are made out of such arrogance. Because it's like, well, God, you know, if you're going to be God, then you're going to have to show me something. Now think about the way they say that and, and what they're doing. What they're basically saying is, God, if you want me in your club, then what am I going to get out of it? What am I, you got to show me something. Because, you know, I just don't go anywhere, you know. I got to, I got to see something that's worthwhile. So God, you got to show me something. And it, it's, it's amazing because it's, it's, it's not about God, it's about them. It's what I want. It's what I, what I need, what I demand. And so the world begins to put these demands on what they expect out of God. And they begin to define God in a way that is really so much smaller than what God really is. And so you're dealing with people who don't know God, and so they want to define God by their own standard, which is so much smaller than God's standards. And so, so much more limited. So, the first thing, the first way that the world looks at God is they look at him as a sign giver. I want to see something. If you can show me something, <clears throat> okay, you'll be lucky to get me in your club. The second thing is the world makes demands on God. Uh, uh, Luke 23, verse 9. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. 
So Herod says, show me something, and Jesus doesn't show him anything. And so he starts questioning him, starts questioning him, starts questioning him, and starts making demands on him. Come on, you got to do this, come on. You know, they say that you're a, you're a god, they say you're a king, they say, you know, come on, show, show me something, give me something here. You know, it's, come on, show up. And the world begins to make demands on God. You've got to do things the way I expect you to do things, God, for me to believe in you. You've got, you've got to show me something that, that uh, will satisfy my demands. And then the third thing that happens, and we see it in the same verse, is that God remains silent. God just remains silent. Jesus didn't answer. And so what happens then is the world begins to talk about how the fact is that God, maybe he doesn't even exist because just, he just doesn't answer. Where is God when we need him? Where is God when I'm asking questions and he's not giving me the answers? Why doesn't God speak? Why doesn't God reveal himself? If it's so important, then why doesn't God reveal himself to us? And that's the way the world is looking at God. That's the way they're looking at Christ. I had uh, several years ago, I had a, I was cornered by this very angry and antagonistic guy who's mad at God. And it seems that his marriage had fallen apart and he'd lost his business and his whole world was just in pieces. And he blamed God, which I thought was, was odd because he didn't even really have a relationship with God, but he was blaming God. So he blamed God for a marriage that failed, and he blames God for a lost business, and <clears throat> he's angry at God. And what he, what he was really angry about, because this came out in the conversation, was that God never answered him. God never gave me an answer. I needed this, I needed God to do this and this and this and this, and he never came through. He never gave me an answer. And he was angry that God had remained silent while his life was falling apart. And he sneered at me, and he says, Thanks so much for your loving, compassionate God. What do you say to that? And the only thing that I could come up with, the only answer I could come up with for him at that time was, I said to him, and I called him by name, and I said, look, maybe you're asking the wrong questions. Maybe you're asking the wrong questions. You see, Jesus' ministry was about two things. There were two, if, if, when you look at Jesus' ministry, the way he ministered, the way he, he went about his business, the way he connected with people, there were two things that he did. Number one, he met people's needs. Number two, he answered their questions. That was how Jesus ministered. He went about meeting people's needs and answering their questions. He responded to questions like, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, how many times should we forgive someone? How do we pray? When will God establish his kingdom? And on and on and on and on. And Jesus gladly answered those questions. He took time to answer those questions, sometimes at great length. But notice something. When the people came to him and said, show us a sign, he never did. Now, he obviously was showing signs and wonders. I mean, people were seeing it. There were miraculous things happening. But when people came to him and said, show us something, do a miracle, do, do something. Let's see, you know, you know it's, 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 it's almost like going to a comedian and say, be funny. You know, tell us a joke. It's like we want to be entertained. But listen, God is not in the business of entertaining us. He's in the business of preparing us for eternity. If you think that God is looking at your life as something that is just here on earth and then it's over with here on earth, you are sadly, sadly mistaken. God, I'm trying to look, I was trying to look earlier for that little speck that we drew on the wall here. I think we, oh, there it is. Oh, no, yeah, here it is, right here. See it? Right there? Well, I can see it. It's right there. Take it by faith. It's right there. There's that speck. That's life. That's us. That's here. That's the time frame that we live in. And the rest of this is beyond its eternity. And our life, I've already lost the spot. Oh, here it is. Our life is, we, our life is so tied up in this little speck in eternity right now. We think of our life as this is it. This, this is, it's all about us right here in this little speck. God steps back. And he looks at the expanse of eternity and he says, I'm preparing you for eternity. 
You are an eternal being. That's what I'm preparing you for. Your life is bigger than what's going on right now. So when people come to God and, and they are looking for a sign and they're making demands and God doesn't speak, maybe they're asking the wrong questions. Which leads us to the fourth thing that the world does, the way that they look at God, and that is when the world doesn't get their way, they turn on God. When the world doesn't get their way, they turn on God. So Luke 23, verses 10 and 11, the chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him, and they arrayed him in splendid clothing and sent him back to Pilate. Now, I want you to see two things that happen here. First of all, they treated him with contempt. Uh, they most likely were taunting him and making disparaging remarks, which is exactly what the world does. I mean, it's just what the world, when the, when the world doesn't get their way with God, they begin mocking God. They begin taunting him. They go, okay, God, if you're really God, you know, I'll strike me down right now. Ha, 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 ha. You know, if there is a God, da, 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 da. there can't be a God because look at all the starving children. So God doesn't really care. They begin taunting God. They, they, they begin coming up with these taunts that they think satisfies their point. That they're, 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 they're so contemptuous against God and they think that that just proves their point. The second thing is they the world responds with mockery. It's pretty much the same way that Herod and his soldiers responded. They began mocking. Oh, yeah? Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross? We'll be studying this in a few weeks. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, what did the people say? If you're God, why don't you come down from the cross? <laughs> mockery. The world does the same thing today. If you're God, why don't you? Da, 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 da. And then they also do it angrily. If you're God, then why did you let my sister die? If you're God, why did you let this happen? If you're God, why didn't you step in? If you're God, that's mockery. That's mocking God. Anytime you say, if you're God, you're mocking. The world is mocking. And so they were mocking God, and then they committed the ultimate mockery. They refused to acknowledge who Jesus was, but they pretended to. Do you see that? You see, Jesus had, was the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He was God. And so they said, okay, if you're God... We'll treat you like God. And they get this splendid robe, this white robe with, that had this shining element in it and put it on him and really made fun of him. <laughs> Bow down to the king of the, the Jews. <laughs> and they were pretending to acknowledge who he is, but that's all it was. They were pretending. They didn't really believe. And listen to what I'm about to say. Some Christians, many Christians, do the same thing. Many Christians do the very same thing. If we believe that Jesus is who he said he is and showed who he is, then to not allow him the place in our life of being Lord of Lords and King of Kings is nothing short of mockery. It's saying, okay, you are who you are, I believe who you are, but you're just pretending. Christians who say they're Christians, but Jesus isn't really Lord of their life, he isn't King of kings and Lord of lords of their life, are mocking God. They're pretending that he is who he is, but he's not real in their life. He's not, they're not really, and sometimes they'll go through periods of time where he is, and other times they won't. I'll just kind of like, eh, do it myself. I'll be in charge of my own life. Thank you very much. I don't like the way you're handling it, so I'll, I'll take care of it right now. I'll do it myself. Mockery. That's just simple, plain mockery of God. 
So where are you? Sure, the world puts Jesus on trial, and they treat him with contempt and scorn. But as a follower of Jesus, have you been putting him on trial? And treating him with contempt because he's not doing what you want him to do? Maybe you're asking the wrong questions. Or have you been pretending that you are a follower, but really you haven't been following him? You've been mocking him. What will you do with Jesus? How will this trial end in your life? Let's pray. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.